Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds for the final Grand Rounds of the year. Um, it's really my pleasure today to introduce two faculty members uh, who were recruited by Dr. Hamden both in 2013 to our Department of Medicine, um, speaking about a topic that's close to my own heart. Um, first is going to be Dr. Jennifer Wright. Dr. Wright is a graduate of the Worcester Polytechnic Institute with uh, her degree in biochemistry and then went on to Tufts for her medical degree as well as a master's in arts in uh, law and diplomacy from the Fletcher School. She then went on to McGraw Medical Center of Northwestern for her medicine residency followed by a cardiology fellowship and EP and chief EP fellowship at Loyola. She uh, joined the faculty um, at the Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, and then in 2013, we were fortunate to recruit her to the University of Wisconsin, where she, she's a clinical assistant professor and associate program director for the Fellowship in Electrophysiology. Uh, among her other activities, she serves on the Medical School Admissions Committee. Um, she'll be followed by Dr. Ann O'Connor. Dr. O'Connor is a graduate of Notre Dame and then undertook her medical degree at Georgetown. After that, she trained in internal medicine uh, and then cardiology at the University of Chicago and was recruited to the faculty of the University of Chicago where she served as an assistant professor until being recruited here where she serves as assistant professor of medicine CHS uh, in the cardiovascular division. She also is director of the inpatient cardiovascular medicine service as well as Director of Quality for Cardiovascular Medicine uh, here for the University of Wisconsin. And among her many activities includes she is a member of the American College of Cardiology Women in Cardiology Committee. Um, it's really my pleasure to uh, invite these two to present to you today. I believe Dr. Jennifer Wright is going to be starting off as they uh, present uh, really some novel insights and opportunities for care in grand rounds entitled Atrial Fibrillation, Can We Organize the Chaos? Please first join me in welcoming Dr. Wright. Thank you so much, Dr. Page. He actually stole my opening line, which was to say that atrial fibrillation is very close to my heart also. So um, anybody, I, I wanted to start off by taking a show of hands. Anybody in this audience ever manage a patient with atrial fibrillation? All right, great. <laughs> That's what I figured. Also, anybody have any experience with chaos? Maybe in their lives? A couple people? Yeah, okay. Me too. So hopefully at least we can target one aspect of your chaotic lives when we're talking about atrial fibrillation today and at least organize that part. So to get started, we don't have any disclosures to report. And the objectives of this talk, first we're going to be um, coming out of this hoping to list evidence-based management for atrial fibrillation, in particular looking at certain modifiable risk factors, anticoagulation, ryth rhythm control, and rate control. And then the next objective is going to be able to identify possible mechanisms for standardizing atrial fibrillation. So the outline will be as follows. First, I will talk about the overview of atrial fibrillation. Why is it important? Next, then, I'm going to talk about those management strategies, including the modifiable risk factors, anticoagulation, rate control, and rhythm management. Following that, Dr. O'Connor is going to come in and talk about how the guidelines truly guide us with standardization, and then the potential impact of standardization, why it's potentially important. What is the current data on standardization? And then what are we doing at UW with respect to standardization? So I do have a pretest in here, and I'm not going to do the show of hands yet, but at the end we will. So there's three questions just want you to mull over while we're talking today. Which of the following are important modifiable risk factors when managing atrial fibrillation? Obstructive sleep apnea, obesity and exercise, tobacco use, alcohol use, all of the above. Second question. Which of the following anticoagulants have been reproducibly shown to effectively reduce stroke risk in atrial fibrillation patients? Apixaban, rivaroxaban, warfarin, aspirin, all of the above. Apix 
Oxfam, River Oxfam, and Warfarin only. Last, all of the following are true regarding atrial fibrillation ablation except, so this is the negative, atrial fibrillation ablation is curative, patients should remain on, atrial, on anticoagulation after ablation according to their chest to vest. Ablation is often more effective than medications for managing sinus rhythm or maintaining sinus rhythm. And ablation success diminishes the longer that one remains in persistent AFib. All right, so getting started. Why are we here today? Why is AFib important? Well, I think it's evidenced by the fact that basically everybody raised their hands in this audience and that we've all encountered patients with AFib because AFib is the most common arrhythmia that we encounter. And in fact, the number of patients diagnosed with atrial fibrillation is expected to be around 12 million by the year 2030. And that number is probably underestimated. And that's because we know in patients who have indwelling pacemakers that a lot of those patients have asymptomatic atrial fibrillation, up to 50%. And so what happens when patients have pacemakers, they have atrial leads in there, and the atrial leads record the atrial fibrillation that tell us when the atrial fibrillation occurred and how long it occurred for. The reason it's important is because of the impact of atrial fibrillation in that it increases morbidity. In fact, it increases one's stroke risk by five times. It also increases the risk of heart failure, dementia, and mortality. So taking a step back, what is atrial fibrillation? Well, first we've got to understand what sinus rhythm is. So sinus rhythm essentially initiates in the sinus node, which is an epicardial structure in the right atrium. Imagine that it's very organized and the opposite of chaos. This is your heart's light switch, going on about 60, 80 beats per minute, depending on what you're doing. Now this is in contrast to atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, your sinus node is suppressed. But now you have these triggers in the pulmonary veins. Recall that the pulmonary veins are draining the oxygenated blood from the lungs into the left atrium. These triggers fire off very rapidly, enter the atrium, and cause chaotic, disorganized movement. And such that the top chambers are going anywhere between 300 to 600 beats per minute at a time. So instead of your really organized light switch, now you have kind of a rave or a strobe light. So with atrial fibrillation, we define it by the type of AFib. So there is paroxysmal, meaning that the patients go in and out of AFib. Persistent, meaning they're in it persistently for at least seven days in duration. The long-standing persistence, patients who are in AFib for at least one year's time. And then permanent. Permanent is tough because those tend to be the patients that we're not going to be pursuing a rhythm management strategy in. So the definition can be a little bit variable. But this is important when we're trying to think about how um, rhythm management is going to be successful when we're um, evaluating these patients. There are many risk factors for AFib. This slide is very busy. But the point of this is that there are modifiable risk factors. So in particular, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, alcohol use, tobacco use, all important modifiable risk factors that we can discuss with our patients. So the take home points on why AFib is important. Number one, AFib is common, likely underdiagnosed. AFib increases morbidity, mortality, stroke, dementia. And multiple risk factors for AFib exist, but many of them are modifiable. So going on to those modifiable risk factors, obesity. Obesity is a large driver of atrial fibrillation. And the good news is, is that we know that when we treat obesity or patients lose weight, that their AFib burden does go down. The legacy study followed many patients over five years. These patients had BMIs greater than or equal to 27. And when they followed them and encouraged weight loss, and it was an aggressive weight loss strategy meeting with dietitians and exercise physiologists in the clinic, they found that when patients lost at least 10% of their weight over that follow-up period of five years, 46% of them remained arrhythmia-free. Now, this may not seem that high to you, 46%, but actually it is. When we think about these are the patients who are not receiving antiarrhythmic drugs or ablations, so just weight loss, because then if you compare it to the patients who lost less weight, but a little bit, that number goes down markedly, followed by 13% in the ones who don't lose as much. Those numbers increase a lot once you add the antiarrhythmic drugs and ablation. 
In fact, that 10% weight loss group, when you add antiarrhythmic drugs and ablation, gets up to 86%. That's really good. Obstructive sleep apnea, also major. And the reason for that is because AFib prevalence is almost five times higher in the untreated obstructive sleep apnea patient than it is in the general population. When we treat, and so, this, so this is good news, just like obesity, when we treat the patients with obstructive sleep apnea effectively with CPAP, we reduce their arrhythmia burden to the point as if they didn't have obstructive sleep apnea. And in fact, what this graph shows is that in ablation patients, when we treat, when we ablate the patients and then treat them with CPAP, their success is the same as patients who don't have obstructive sleep apnea. And that's in contrast to the bottom line. That, those two bottom lines compare patients who are not treated for their sleep apnea versus patients who didn't undergo ablation. So essentially, if you don't treat their sleep apnea and you ablate them, you're really not helping them out too much. Same is true with cardioversion. So if we cardiovert patients and they're treated with their CPAP, they do a lot better than the patients who aren't. And interestingly, this number, this 42% recurrence in CPAP users, is actually lower than that of the general population, which is about 50%. So maybe there's some question of whether or not we are under-diagnosing some patients. Smoking cessation. We know that smoking increases the risk of atrial fibrillation by 50%. Current smokers, more. And when we ablate the patients who are smoking or even have a prior smoking history, their risk of recurrence is higher. Activity is very important. I used to think when I was a resident that activity was bad in atrial fibrillation. In fact, though, it's good, especially light to moderate exercise. And when you follow patients over time who are exercising on a regular basis, their risk of AFib goes down. And, but the contrast is true for the extreme exercise. Extreme exercise, actually, the risk goes up again. Arrest AFib was a nice study in that combined all of these modifiable risk factors in um, ablation patients. And these are essentially taking a look at weight loss, exercise, and then managing their diabetes, hypertension, alcohol use, and tobacco use very strictly, and meeting with them in multidisciplinary clinics. This is done in Australia. And what they found is that with one ablation procedure, that their single procedure success rate was a lot higher compared to patients who were just encouraged to do so. So major, major outcome differences when we are modifying those risk factors. So the take home points with modifiable risk factors. Early referral of sleep medicine is important. Um, I believe we're probably under diagnosing our AFib patients. Counseling on alcohol and tobacco use is important, and also encouraging weight loss and exercise. The more weight loss, the better. Moving on to anticoagulation. So I told you earlier that atrial fibrillation increases the risk of stroke by five times. This is the same whether or not you have paroxysmal or persistent AFib or atrial fib or atrial flutter. The question, though, that often arises is, well, how much AFib is enough? Is it like five seconds? Is it, is it 50 minutes? Well, there were two studies that addressed that, and it's because likely in between six minutes and five and a half hours. And again, we're coming back to pacemaker patients. So patients have indwelling pacemakers, and we know exactly how long their atrial fibrillation is. And the ASSERT study showed that a, potentially six minutes is all it takes to increase one stroke risk. That's in contrast to the rate registry, which was presented to AHA this past fall. Rate registry showed that probably 15 to 20 seconds isn't enough. So then the question is, well, what about one minute? What about three minutes? We just don't know at this point. So who does qualify for anticoagulation? All patients with valvular heart disease. Valvular heart disease means that anybody who's had work on their valves, including a valve repair or valve replacement, or anyone who has significant mitral valve stenosis. Next, any patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should be anticoagulated. And if the patient does not have valvular heart disease or does not have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we then refer to the chads 2 vas scoring system. The chads 2 vas describes one point for each of the following risk factors. 
and then a total, you can total up to a top total of nine. And then so the risk factors include congestive heart failure for one point, hypertension one point, age greater than 65, one point, 75, two points, diabetes, one point, stroke thromboembolism would be two points, and then uh, the presence of uh, coronary artery disease or peripheral vascular disease, and that includes aortic aneurysm, and then female gender. As the numbers increase, the yearly risk of stroke increases. So very important. While bridging is typically not necessary for patients, and there are some patients it is, delays in anticoagulation can actually impact morbidity by increasing the risk for dementia. So this study was actually presented at Heart Rhythm a few weeks ago in that they showed a correlation with delay in anticoagulation initiation and development of dementia. Interestingly, though, we are much more apt to start antiplatelet therapy earlier then we are to start warfarin. You can see by that red circle that I just put there that within 30 days, only 5% of patients were taking warfarin versus 48% of patients taking aspirin or Plavix. And then if you look at even the chest to vascular greater than 5, that still remained true. That number in warfarin is only 7.9%. And also what happens is then over time, it's a linear increase in the risk of dementia. Now, warfarin had a lower dementia rate than the aspirin or Plavix. But notice here, if warfarin was initiated within 30 days in that 5% of patients, that risk of dementia was negligible. There's no yellow bar there. So, what, so who then qualifies? So when we're talking about um, chas 2 vast patients of zero, it's reasonable to omit any anticoagulant therapy. <clears throat> I can tell you that my practice has changed over the past years in recommending aspirin. I used to recommend aspirin for all low-risk patients. However, I'm not so sure that that's the best thing to do now. And the reason being, if you actually take a look at the studies, now this, the, the, right, the left part of the slide here is busy. But what this list are the studies that actually compare um, the uh, antiplatelet therapies with you know, stroke risk reduction. Notice most of these studies cross zero, so meaning that they are not statistically significant. There is only one study that's been statistically significant with ensuring risk reduction when it comes to atrial fibrillation. That was the SPAF study. Every other study, not statistically significant. But the thing is about aspirin, it's that it's not without its faults. And in fact, aspirin does increase the risk of bleeding, and our GI colleagues can attest to that. Now, there was a study that actually compared aspirin with Pixaban and showed actually similar bleeding risk. At the same time, the stroke risk reduction was markedly improved with the Pixaban versus aspirin. When it comes to chas 2 of one that's when the guidelines will say, well, it's up to you, a shared decision-making process with you and your patient. Because at that point, the risk of stroke is somewhat equivalent to the risk of bleeding. Now, so it's up to you to choose aspirin, meh, maybe, versus warfarin or one of the other anticoagulants or nothing. Some people are leaning towards anticoagulating these patients, but there may be some patients that you wouldn't want to, like, for example, if they're Alaskan king crab fishermen or something, and they're doing a dangerous job, you may not want to necessarily recommend it for those patients. But anybody with a CHADS2 VASC of 2 or greater, anticoagulation is recommended. So our options for decreasing CBA risk. Warfarin, a lot of us have experienced warfarin. Warfarin's been around for a while, it's tried and true. It's inexpensive and it's reversible. The negative of warfarin though is the patients have to keep following up for their INR checks and their INRs can be quite variable depending on their vitamin K absorption and intake. The direct oral anticoagulants are favorable in patients who have variable INRs, so it gives them a steady state of anticoagulation decreases the risk of bleeding in those patients, but also the, they don't have to go and be monitored on a regular basis. The cons of these, number one, is that it can be very expensive, and number two is that there's no FDA-approved reversal agent at this point for the factor 10 a inhibitors. There is an FDA-approved reversal agent for dabigatran. Keep in mind, the direct oral anticoagulants are not recommended for valvular heart disease. It's actually contraindicated in the setting of a mechanical heart valve, as was shown in the realigned study, 
where patients had increased valve thrombosis and increased bleeding risk. We just don't know about the valve repairs and microvalve stenosis patients at this point, or the bioprosthetic valves. There's just no data on it. So what are the factor 10A inhibitors? I'm going to go over those really fast. Rivaroxaban, apixaban, otherwise known as Eliquis, adoxaban, and then the direct thrombin inhibitor is the Begatran. Now all of these studies have shown at least it's good as warfarin with stroke risk reduction in bleeding. Apixaban, maybe it's a little bit better with respect to reducing the stroke risk and decreasing the bleeding risk. However, there are differences in the trial's design, each trial, in that there's a difference also in the patient population. But there's been no direct head-to-head -head randomized comparison of these direct oral anticoagulants, and there probably won't be. I often get asked, what about dual antiplatelet therapy in our AFib patients? Is that good enough? So if you treat your patient with aspirin and Plavix because they just had an MI. Unfortunately, what the ACTIV-W study showed us is that it's really not that good at reducing our, our CVA risk for AFib patients. Um, and it also increases the bleeding risk. But then when you add on triple therapy to decrease your stroke risk with respect to AFib, the bleeding risk does go up markedly. There has been at least one randomized study showing that if you stop the aspirin, patients do pretty well with just Plavix and Warfarin. But there are problems with that study and that it was an open label study. We don't have much data with respect to the, the direct anticoagulants. There have been a couple studies, for example, Pioneer AFib using rivaroxaban, which is Xeralto, but the dosages of rivaroxaban used were variable and they weren't the typical doses that we would use in our AFib patients. So summarizing the take home points for anticoagulation. We want to anticoagulate patients with valvular heart disease and a CHAS too fast, greater than or equal to two, consider it for one, and consider initiation within 30 days based upon that dementia data. Aspirin's likely not very beneficial in CVA risk reduction and has its problems. Shared decision making is encouraged when discussing the risks and benefits of the direct oral anticoagulants versus warfarin for your patients. So rate control, the goal rate for managing atrial fibrillation um, is less than 80 in most patients. Now, some patients we can be more lenient with, but for most patients we recommend less than 80. And we typically recommend using a beta blocker or non pyridine calcium channel blocker. What we're doing is we're slowing the rate at which the AFib is perpetuating through the AV mode. We do want to avoid calcium channel blockers, though, in the setting of heart failure because of its negative inotropic effects. Digoxin, typically recommend avoiding monotherapy in the, except in the setting of decompensated heart failure. And then once the patients are compensated, transitioning them over to beta blockers. Digoxin is a narrow therapeutic window. It certainly does have its use, though, in the setting of concaminate therapy with beta blockers. Amiodarone is also an option in your acutely ill patient. Just be cautious that it can cause hypotension with its beta blocker effect. Take-home points with rate control. Goal is less than 80 in most patients, especially your heart failure and symptomatic patients. You should have probably avoid digoxin therapy, that's monotherapy, except in the setting of decompensated heart failure. Beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are the way to go, though, with standard rate control management. So when it comes to rhythm management, no randomized control study has shown an overall maternity benefit. Of course, there's subsets of those studies, and I'm referring to a firm that those patients who were in sinus rhythm actually did a little bit better. But many studies have subsequently shown um, an improved quality of life, especially in our symptomatic patients, and less heart failure symptoms when we obtain and maintain sinus rhythm. So while routine rhythm management isn't recommended in our patients, it certainly should be considered in some, including those patients with heart failure, symptoms, and are young. And keep in mind, the longer that we wait, so the longer that the patients are in AFib, their, their hearts get used to being in AFib, the harder it is to get them in sinus rhythm or to maintain sinus rhythm. So methods for management, there's three. We can cardiovert them. These are our persistent patients. We can give them antiarrhythmic drugs, our persistence and paroxysmals. And we can perform a catheter ablation. So talking about those in a little bit more detail. Antiarrhythmic medications target the atrial tissue. So they target those triggers in the pulmonary veins and also the atrial tissue itself. However, they're not 100% successful. 
at best, we're 70% for one year, and that's with amiodarone, which is kind of the big gun. Other drugs tend to be less efficacious. And so if a patient does fail one drug, though, and you give them a second drug, the likelihood that they're going to maintain sinus rhythm for the next year is actually fairly low, and as low as 30%, and that's even with amiodarone. So there are certain contraindications that are going to apply to certain patients with respect to choosing your antiarrhythmic drug, and there is the risk of adverse reaction. So it's important to counsel your patient and be aware what are the contraindications to certain antiarrhythmics. Catheter ablation is another option for patients, especially if they fail an antiarrhythmic drug. So oftentimes people ask me, well, what are you guys doing there? What are you doing with this catheter ablation thing? So I have some pictures of an ablation I did last week. So this is a left atrium. And remember, those triggers are in the pulmonary veins. So what our goal is, is to actually electrically isolate the pulmonary veins from the left atrium. So those triggers are going to fire off, but then when they meet our ablation points, which are actually electrical roadblocks or scar, they can't go anywhere. So they can't cause the atrial fibrillation. So that's what we're doing in our pulmonary vein isolation. You may have seen that acronym before, PVI. So catheter ablation is more effective than antiarrhythmic drugs, but it's not curative unfortunately. And that's catheter ablation for AFib. There are other ablations that we do that are curative, but this one is not. And the success is dependent on the type of AFib and your patient's risk factors. So for paroxysmal patients, the success is going to be better than for our persistent patients, even our long-standing persistent patients. So because ablation is not curative, the stroke risk really doesn't change after ablation. So we need to continue anticoagulation based upon the CHAS-2 mask. The success rate is better for those with a shorter AFib duration, and it does increase the more procedures we do. So if we're doing just one ablation, maybe we quote a 70% success with paroxysmal patients. But if we do two, we can get probably above 80%. But we do need to weigh the risks of the ablation versus the benefits. So now at this point in 2017, we're taking our symptomatic patients. But we're going to be awaiting the results of the Cabana trial. Cabana is a randomized trial comparing uh, mortality or morbidity with antiarrhythmic drugs and ablation. Because we want to see, does ablation actually affect mortality? If it impacts mortality, this can potentially change the way we're managing AFib at this point. So while ablation isn't curative, it certainly can improve one's quality of life and morbidity. So the take-home points for rhythm management. Consider rhythm control, especially in your young symptomatic patients. Earlier, the better. But no rhythm modality to date is curative. Anticoagulation should be based on the CHAS-2 vascor, regardless of the presence of ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs. And keep in mind, risk factor reduction that I talked about a lot at the beginning of this talk is super important when it comes to AFib management and ablation management. So in conclusion, to my part, AFib is common, likely underdiagnosed. AFib increases morbidity, mortality, stroke, dementia, heart failure. Many risk factors for AFib are modifiable. And anticoagulate patients with AFib with valvular heart disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and a CHAS-2 vas greater than or equal to 2, or to consider for 1. Aspirin is likely not super beneficial in our AFib population. And consider rhythm control in your young symptomatic patients. The earlier, the better. Unfortunately, no rhythm modality to date is curative, but we can certainly impact uh, the quality of life of our patients. So recall our post-test. So everybody got their answers now? All right, which of the following are important modifiable risk factors when managing AFib? So we'll do a show of hands. Obstructive sleep apnea, BC and exercise, tobacco use, alcohol use, all of the above. So how about A? How about B, C, D, E? Yes. All right. I'd like to say you learned something. You may have known this already. <laughs> so, all right. Which of the following anticoagulants have been reproducibly shown to reduce stroke risk in AFib patients? So recall, Pixaban, Rivaroxaban, Warfarin, Aspirin, all of the above, or Pixaban, Rivaroxaban, Warfarin only. So about A, B, C. D, E, F. Oh, yeah. Okay. Nice job. All right. 
We're awake on Friday morning. All of the following are true regarding AFib ablation except A, ablation for AFib is curative. Patients should remain on anticoagulation after ablation according to their chas vas Ablation is more effective than medications for maintaining sinus rhythm. And ablation success diminishes the longer that one remains in AFib. So all of the following are true except. How about A? Yes. All right. Very good. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. O'Connor. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. That was a great overview of AFib management. Um, when she showed the pulmonary vein isolation picture, I'm sure for all the electrophysiologists, that looks like a beautiful picture. For a general cardiologist, it kind of looks one, like one of my kids' art projects. I'm sorry. I'm sure it was very beautiful. So, um, so uh, the rest of this talk, we're going to talk about standardization. Um, we've all taken care of patients with AFib. We see the variability or the chaos in the management. And two very similar patients can be managed in very different ways. And so... Um, what we're talking about here are there pathways um, or protocols that we should be using or implementing or developing on our own um, to help with management for these patients to address issues of quality for, of care and also to address some of the high costs associated with their care. So um, what do the guidelines tell us about this? Uh, we're lucky here to have two of the authors of the 2014 ACC AHA um, guidelines here at UW in Dr. January and Dr. Field. And I bet if I asked either of them how, to, how they would manage a particular patient that we see in the consult service or in our clinics, there's a good chance I might get two different answers. So as far as standardization, um, there's not too much in the guidelines. Um, so if we think about our patient with new onset of atrial fibrillation, it doesn't take long to see where the variability comes in. We meet these patients in lots of different uh, locations, or whether or not they're admitted to the hospital, in our own clinics, in the emergency department, or whether or not they've come in uh, for a procedure and they're incidentally noted to be in atrial fibrillation. And then Jen talked about all the different domains uh, with rate control and anticoagulation and rhythm control. And there's a lot of different decisions and choices that can be made there, so there's quite a bit of variability. So if we take rate control as an example, and we, if we think about rate control here, <coughs> In the hospital, in the acute setting, you, you'll definitely see uh, residents in uh, uh, the hospital see a lot of variability in how this is managed. So what do the guidelines, as an example, show us in regards to a standardized approach? Well, the guidelines, as Jen went over, um, they do give us some guidance when to avoid certain agents, particularly the calcium channel blockers and heart failure, and to think about digoxin and the heart failure patient earlier than some of the other agents. Um, it provides a list of all the different uh, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers to choose from with the doses and uh, both IV and PO. But there's not a lot of specifics about how to titrate the medications other than we're shooting for a goal heart rate of less than 80 in these patients. Um, not a lot about when to add a second agent um, and what clinical setting. Who would be an appropriate patient who comes in with AFib with fast rates who could be managed as an outpatient? Um, and nothing in, uh, on the specifics about once you start someone on, on IV medications, how to tr um, titrate and um, transition to oral medications. So there's a big opportunity here for standardization. Um, so what's the potential impact? Um, I think the two things we can keep in mind is there's probably some potential to improve quality and help um, if we find the cost-effective ways to do this to help lower costs and resource use. And I see these pathways and protocols as a tool to help us do the right thing for our patients. So as far as improving quality, we all know in all different um, medical problems, there are often big gaps between what our guidelines tell us and what we're doing in clinical practice. Um, and it's true for AFib as well. So as two examples, in our patients that we're managing with a, a rate control strategy, which is about two thirds of our patients with AFib, nearly 60% of, of those patients are still having symptoms. So we're, we could do a better job here. And then in regards to anticoagulation, there's a, this is a big area of opportunity. Um, as Jen mentioned, the risk for um, strokes still exists in patients on a rhythm control st strategy, uh, but the, that patient population is generally undertreated compared to patients on a rate control strategy. Um, even our high-risk patients um, are undertreated, and maybe some of our low-risk patients are, over, are overtreated. Um, so this is data here from the Pinnacle Registry. So the Pinnacle Registry is a U.S. registry of um, outpatients. It's a voluntary registry. It includes about 170 to 180 different uh, practices. Most of them are cardiology practices. There are some multi-specialty and internal medicine practices. 
Um, but all this data um, is collected and put together. And this group, this includes hundreds of thousands of patient encounters. Um, data started, collection started in 2008, and this is through 2012 that they looked at this. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see the distribution of the chads fast score in this patient population. And a large percentage of them, over 85%, have a chads fast score of greater than 2. And on the right here is the distribution of their chads fast score and their rates of anticoagulation. What you can see is um, anticoagulation rates in this patient population are around 50 to 55%, despite chads fast scores are greater than 2. And also what you can see is in a low-risk patient population with a CHADS fast score of zero, about a third of the patients are receiving oral anticoagulation of some form. So we definitely have some room for improvement in regards to anticoagulation in our AFib patients. So moving on to cost, excuse me, <clears throat> it's estimated that we spend about six to seven billion dollars per year in AFib management. This is lower than in a heart failure or coronary disease, but still a significant uh, a number. And about 50 to 80 percent of those costs are related to inpatient care or emergency room care. Um, and this probably will not come as a surprise to you, but th what this map is uh, on the right hand side is um, admission rates from 1999, and then um, on the left hand side is admission rates um, by, in 2013 in a Medicare patient population. And as you can see with the red and orange, that has increased in the 2013. Admission rates for AFib have increased over this time frame. And with increased admission rates, we uh, go along increased costs. So what has been done for standardization and um, practice protocols for this patient population? Well, most of the work has been done in the emergency room and the acute setting. Um, ED man um, management protocols have been shown to reduce admission rates for AFib from 20 to 50 percent, and there's been a cost savings from anywhere from 1,400 to 2,500 uh, dollars per patient, and, and these protocols are not associated with any adverse outcomes in patients who are managed as an outpatient rather than admitted to the hospital. Um, one group that's done a lot of work on this is the group at Mayo, um, and what they ha have developed is an ED observation unit pathway for the management of AFib patients, and they've been able to show both a cost reduction as well as uh, lower ED rates without any adverse events in their, in their patient population. In regards to the cost saving, they did an interesting analysis. So um, they looked at their ED observation unit patient cost, and then they looked back at the patients who a year before this protocol was implemented who had a length of stay of less than one day. So potentially the patients that are now candidates for their ED observation unit. And they were able to show about a 40% reduction in the cost. And most of that cost was associated with the professional fees in the rooms. So it's much more expensive to take care of a patient in an inpatient bed rather than an ED observation unit. Um, Jen talked quite a bit about risk factor modification. And two of those studies that she alluded to had very similar protocols as far as what the regimen was for um, risk factor modification. And those studies were, excuse me, the Legacy study and the REST AF study. And they had a very set protocol for weight management. They came to a weight management clinic at least every three months. Um, they met with um, exercise physiologists and had a goal um, prescription exercise of uh, 200 minutes per week. Um, they were managed with tight blood pressure management. Uh, the goal blood pressure was 130 over 80. If they um, monitored these patients with 24-hour um, blood pressure monitors, and if they weren't at goal, um, medications were intensified. Tight gly um, glycemic control, if their A1Cs were greater than 7 on one oral agent, um, they were referred on to diabetes clinics. Um, tight lipid control, they were all screened for obstructive sleep apnea and received counseling for smoking cessation and were advised to drink less than three alcoholic beverages per week. <clears throat> in the U.S. population, it's estimated over half of our AFib patients meet all the criteria for the legacy um, study. So it's a large patient population that could be affected by this. And as we saw, um, effective weight loss can really reduce um, AFib recurrence, both for patients managed medically uh, and for patients who have gone to ablations. So what are we doing here at UW? Um, so it's, it's a lot to, take, to chew um, when you take off all these patients. They're coming from us from many different locations. And so how we've approached this is um, building algorithms and pathways based on the clinical setting that patients present. So the first one I want to talk about is the protocol that we have with the Digestive Health Center. And it's an interesting story. They actually came to us when they heard um, Jen and other folks were working on all other algorithms. 
the issue they were, they were having is some patients were coming to the, have their GI procedures and they were in AFib either as a new diagnosis or having rates that were uncontrolled. And they saw a lot of variability in how the clinicians dealt with the patients. And we're just asking for some help and guidance to identify patients that were low risk who could go ahead and have their procedures. Um, so uh, what we've learned is that about 10 to 15 patients are coming to the get their uh, EGDs or colonoscopies a year who are diagnosed with AFib at the time of their procedure. Um, and so we worked with them to develop an algorithm where we could recognize some patients who were going to be low risk, who could go ahead and have their procedure if we get the rates down a little bit. Um, so it, the incurred, Jen has looked at this data with some of the residents, and that uh, we've been able to show a decrease in ED referrals by about 78%, um, and a decrease in cancellations by about 74%. And importantly, there's been no complications in the patients that went ahead and had their, uh, their scopes done. The other group that we've worked with quite a bit is with the ET. And the goal here is to identify patients that could potentially be managed as outpatients rather than admitted for their atrial fibrillation. Um, this protocol, um, and as well as the um, DHC, I under, uh, the, realize the print's very, very small, but these are all available to view on UConnect if you want to see the details of these protocols. Um, so this excludes anybody with atrial fibrillation. Um, and because some of the general guidelines with this is to consider an early cardioversion if patients have presented within 48 hours of symptoms. And for those folks who are outside that 48-hour window or um, it's unknown how long they've been in AFib, to consider rate control and anticoagulation based on the risk score. So I wish I could tell you that this has been hugely successful, but I think we have some room to go. Um, uh, the admission rate for AFib as the primary diagnosis has been pretty flat. It's around 60%. Um, the national average for AFib admissions from the ED is around 60 to 70%. So we're at the national average. Um, interestingly, in this time frame, <coughs> the number of patients that applied to this went up quite a bit. I'm sure all our ED colleagues could attest to that, but during the first half, um, it was about 65 to 70 patients per quarter, and it's now about 115 to 120 patients per quarter that this applies to. When we look a little bit closer, there's a trend uh, to decreasing patients who just get admitted for a day and go home the following day. So I think this is the big potential here. So about a third of the patients with AFib get admitted and go home within 24 hours. So this is a real opportunity that we could work on going forward. Um, so when the patients get admitted from the ER or clinics or elsewhere, um, where, who's taking care of them in the hospital? So a little over half of these patients are on a cardiology surface, and the other half are split between hospital medicine, uh, general medicine, family practice, um, and the other subspecialties. And if someone is admitted excuse me, to a non-cardiology um, service, about a quarter of those patients ha are seen in consults with um, the cardiology service. So when we think about where we can move the bar and help with quality of care and we're reducing costs, when we're talking about a hospital admission, perhaps we can move the bar with lengths of stay and readmissions. And so when you look a little closer at this group, uh, there is some trends that are interesting. I realize a patient that's admitted to cardiology is going to be a different patient that's admitted to general medicine. But is there something we're doing on cardiology where we could help drive down the length of stay? And um, same goes for admissions. Is there something we're doing on cardiology or hospital medicine that's helping with readmissions? It's at this point kind of uh, just bringing up some hypotheses that we can look forward to the future. But with that in mind, um, so some, some potentials for standardization approach to care may have an improved adherence to guideline-based care, a decrease in ED admission rates, a decreased length of stay, uh, decreased readmissions, uh, provide cost savings and improve resource utilization. And one other important thing is to think about is patient safety. Um, we've all seen cases, and I'll, I'll be asked to review a case every quarter or so, where a patient who, who had unrecognized um, LV dysfunction was given a calcium channel blocker, and uh, usually in an IV form, and decompensates. So there is definitely a role to help with patient safety in that particular patient population moving forward. So what are we thinking about doing and what are we planning to do here at UW to help move the bar on AFIF management for AFIF uh, patients? Well, hopefully in the next four to six months, we will be able to announce that we're officially kicking off our AFIF team. Um, this is going to be an APP-run consultative service uh, for our hospitalized patients here with AFIB, kind of very much in the um, model of our diabetes management. 
So if a patient comes in and AFib is an active problem, although it might be lower down on their medical uh, list of problems, we want to be involved to help you manage those patients to get them better rate control and also to make that transition to home to make sure they have everything in place that they need for their AFib management at home. And so in that, um, as we're preparing for this, we're building different algorithms to address patients um, outside the ED scope currently, uh, the medically, medical patients, our post-op patients, and our critically ill patients. Um, so we are currently bringing a couple new nurse practitioners onto our service, and hopefully by the end of the year, beginning of 2018, we'll be able to officially kick this off and provide this as a service to all of you. So future directions. Um, currently, we're working with our ED to build an AFib pathway for cl clinical decision unit, which is the ED observation unit for folks who may not know. Um, Jen has worked with um, the ED at the Unity Point at Meritor. Um, they've used a similar algorithm that we use here in our ED, and she's starting to look at the data um, to see how that's affected their readmissions and outcomes. Um, as we just talked about, our AFib team will be kicking off toward the end of the year, beginning of 2018. Um, we're thinking about out outpatient strategies to help with initial management of these patients and help with timely referrals. Uh, I'll see occasionally see some patients as a general cardiologist where I think, wow, this patient should have gone to EP, and I'm sure that the opposite happens to um, the electrophysiologist where we could have been better managed with a general cardiologist. Um, and prevention programs. Unfortunately, right now, where a big limitation with this is the reimbursement model. Um, this, these reorganized uh, risk factor modification programs are very much like our cardiac rehab program. But unfortunately, AFib is not currently a diagnosis that that would be covered for us. So a couple conclusions. There's room for improvement in clinical practice. The cost of care of AFib is high. A lot of that is driven by a patient population that is growing. ED-based protocols are promising with decreased admissions and decreased cost. A standardized approach to risk factor modification is also very promising. Our, our UW-DHC uh, algorithm has been very well received um, by the group. I, um, it's shown decreased procedure cancelizations and ED referral rates. Um, we haven't yet moved the bar with our ED algorithm, but I think this is an area of opportunity. And I just ask you to stay tuned. So with that, uh, I hope after this hour that Jen and I have convinced you that, yes, we can organize the chaos around atrial fibrillation. Thank you, Drs. Wright and Dr. O'Connor. That was really outstanding. Um, I need to point out that Dr. Hamden is only leaving because his daughter is playing in the state semifinals as the goalie for Edgewood High School. So good luck to Jamila. And go race to Milwaukee, Dr. Hamden. With that, I, before we, uh, I ask you to call in the audience, um, the, um, the Chad's Vask is an improvement over Chad's. And the one point that one has um, leaves the option of aspirin, um, nothing, or full dose anticoagulation. Can you comment on the issue of when the only point is when the patient is a woman? Because that, they, they, yeah. tell me, clarify for me in the audience if you wouldn't mind, please. Sure, that's a great question, I'll take that. Um, so when it comes to gender alone, really the risk factor isn't there. So essentially I treat those patients as if they're a Chad's tree basket of zero. However, when female is then compounded on to one of the other risk factors, that's, what's it, that's what makes it important and that's what makes it an automatic two. Great. Thank you very much. Please call on the audience. Um, so there's a couple groups that have looked at a, a really good integrative care model where they're including patient in the center with the pharmacist, the sleep specialist, the nurses that are involved with their care. It's very promising. Um, um, and as far as the capitation, I, I would think as your, I think how our payment, let me try to answer this. I think as payment models change and we're, paid on a basis of taking care of the whole patient, just not when we're seeing them in the hospital and seeing them in the, the clinic, that some of this is going to be easier to do. Um, I don't know if I can answer it any more than 
that, that I'm hopeful that the changes that are coming with payment models are going to help us provide the care through the continuum of their, their with the patient's need. I'm not answering that. I'll address that. So the question is, with conversion of atrial fibrillation, I'll kind of summarize that a little bit, especially in our acutely ill patients, how long is enough to really increase the risk um, in conversion? Is pharmacologic conversion different than direct current cardioversion? So to answer the first question um, on how long is long enough, we think 48 hours. And so in your low-risk patients, meaning in your chats to VASC, say, less zero or one, the risk of stroke is very low. If you look at the patients coming in overall with uh, less than 48 hours of stroke, the overall risk of uh, stroke with conversion is about 0.7%, so fairly low. However, there are certain subsects within that population that are, are of a higher risk, particularly the patients who have diabetes and heart failure concomitantly. And that's been shown in the Finn Cardioversion Study, which was a population-based study in Finland um, published about a few years ago. So the question, though, in, in this, that study, though, was direct cardioversion. So the question about pharmacologic versus direct, I think there's a lot of debate there. I may tell you one answer, and Dr. Page may tell you a different answer, Dr. January would tell you a different answer. I actually think the mechanism is similar. Now. There have been echo studies which have shown atrial standstill post cardioversion or even pharmacologic cardioversion. It tends to last at least 48 hours, but there are some studies which su suggest that it could be even longer, even up to one month. And that's why we recommend for any patient who's cardioverted and their CHADS2 VASC is say one or even two, trying to anticoagulate them at least for a month afterward but if not more, if, if, you know, they're tolerating the anticoagulation. Any questions? So the question is, uh, does chocolate reduce your risk of AFib? Um, and we hope the answer is yes. <laughs> um, it's just yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a recent study that was an observational study. Um, and it was, I, I don't know if I understood the mechanism, but I liked what the outcome was, that, I get, that eating chocolate was OK. I don't know if you have a better understanding of what yeah, the Yeah, I don't understand the mechanism for it, but I will take it. <laughs> <laughs> So the question is, um, in our patients who vary with their INRs, how good is good enough? And so, and then when potentially maybe, when should we consider conversion over to a direct oral anticoagulant? That's a tough answer. That's a tough question. And I think, though, that once, once you're seeing fluctuations on a regular basis of subtherapeutic and therapeutic and supertherapeutic, especially the patients we continue to call, oh, okay, why don't you go eat some more spinach or hold your, you know, hold your warfarin because their INR is 5, their INR is 6. Those patients, I would strongly consider changing them over to a direct oral anticoagulant, even the older patient population. Um, you know, Aristotle, uh, Rocket, all the, those trials did include older patients to an extent. There's less patients included that are very old. But clinically, a lot of us have been using those, uh, those direct oral anticoagulants, and so far, so good. We just don't have necessarily that 
um, population data on real world data, it's mostly still based upon those trials. So I think it's I think it's kind of a toss up in what you what you want to do. But once you start seeing you know going in and out of those therapeutic range, every once in a while, if you're a three two three three, I wouldn't worry about it. It's the ones who are tend to be higher. I would worry about. try the answer. So the question is, um, on those patients who have uh, anticoagulation rates much lower than we would expect, what's driving that? Um, so um, if, if there's uh, certainly some patients have complications from the anticoagulation, but I don't think we have a really good answer for that. Um, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, I don't. The study which Ann cited, the Sue et al. study, I don't believe that they were actually capable of taking a look at that because it was a population-based study. I think I presume that a lot of the patients who are older tend to have some of the contraindications also. Keeping in mind, though, that a lot of the things that a lot of us think or might be contraindications may not be, um, especially falls. Um, there's been studies showing that falls actually don't really necessarily increase the risk of significant bleeding. And so, again, it's a risk-benefit analysis when we're weighing the um, you know, the benefit of anticoagulation versus the potential risk. And also, what we're talking about is stroke versus bleeding. Can we treat the bleeding? Can we treat the stroke? Which one is harder to treat? So it's kind of based upon that. But we don't really know too much about for that study in particular. Dr. Bolden. So the, the question is, or should we be screening folks for AFib um, because of all their uh, association, bad outcomes associated with the AFib? And I think the answer is we probably should, but I'm not sure if we know the right way to do that. Um, the one time that we often, um, when patients get sleep studies, that's one time that we also get a high referral rate. It's They, they go hand in hand. So I don't know if you have any other comments about yeah. the screening. There have been some studies on this, um, with taking a look at like left atrial dementia, with risk factors, with I, I believe even looking at um, some of the blood pressure trials and seeing predictors. But the one thing too that I've noticed also in my patient population with patients who have atrial flutter, when we ablate their flutter, they're at an automatic increased risk of atrial fibrillation. So for those patients, actually, even though I've cured their flutter, because um, the ablation for atrial flutter is 95% successful, but then up to 50% of those patients are going to develop AFib in the next year. So that is even one example, like just starting at the basic screening, like you have flutter, you have a 50% chance of getting AFib. So this is what we need to do right now. And so get your sleep study, let's manage your blood pressure, let's lose some weight. And so I, I've certainly started there with that population, but it's harder with there's so many risks. Another patient population where I've seen a change recently is patients who've had a stroke who have yet, not yet had a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Um, and so presumably a cryptogenic stroke. Um, we're being much, much more aggressive about long-term monitors or even putting in loop recorders to look for AFib because we're finding that in the end a lot of them were related to atrial fibrillation. We clearly could go on longer, but we've reached the end of our hour. I'm sure Drs. Wright and O'Connor would be willing to take questions up, up front. Uh, at the end of, of Grand Rounds. I just want to thank them both for an outstanding Grand Rounds. Have a great summer. See you back after uh, Labor Day. Okay.